Welcome to the Successful Life Podcast. I am your host, Corey Barrier, and I am here with Dan McCutcheon. God, every time I fuck the damn name up. Anyway, Dan, what's up, dude? What's going on, brother? How are you, man? I'm doing great. So Dan, um, Dan, Dan, Dan is a coach, a speaker, real estate investor, and of course, entrepreneur. You got to be an entrepreneur in order to <laughs> do all those things, Dan. Um, and I want to point out, and Dan did not ask me this, but I think your logo on your shirt and your hat is super cool. Can you tell me about that a little bit? I appreciate that, man. Yeah, it's um, it's a, a brand that um, it's, it's like a family brand. It's a, a legacy piece that I'm starting up. Um, it's called Servant Heart. And it actually came to me, uh, you know, like you mentioned before, I, I do coaching and I do speaking. So I travel quite a bit and I was in a hotel room one night and was getting ready for the, for the weekend and was listening to a message from a couple who happened to be pastors. And I'm very passionate about um, my faith. I'm passionate about my, my marriage, being a father. And, you know, so I just, I try to listen to, to positive things. And I was listening to a message and it was a couple and somebody asked them, what was the key to the success of their marriage? And the husband said, we wake up each and every day striving to outserve one another. And it just really just hit me hard because um, I thought about my relationship with my wife. And a lot of people, you know, will always compliment us and talk about how they love our marriage. They love our interactions. And, you know, some people even will seek us out for advice um, and marriage advice. And, and so that just really resonated with me. And <clears throat> one challenge I've always had, I'm a very creative person. I know things that look good. But if you told me to draw something out of my head, I can't do it. You know, I just, the, the images never stay there. And so I, I, he said that quote and I just kind of stopped for a minute. And I remember closing my eyes and I just saw the logo and I saw the logo, you know, that you see here, the servant heart logo. And uh, I actually Googled an image of a heart on my phone and I was looking through different images. And then I just put it in one of those little, iPhone apps that people make memes out of and I just started playing with some different designs but this was the first time I've actually seen something vividly and it didn't go away um, so I designed the logo on my phone and um, and I loved it when I saw it but I also I was going through a, a pretty difficult season at that time I had had you know a, a business relationship and partnership with a, a best friend of over 20 years go bad guy that was like a brother to me stabbed me in the back over some business and money so I was in a difficult place, not, not a place to really be creative. Um, and, you know, definitely not like, Hey, let me go start some, some clothing brand or, or, or something else. Um, so I just sat on it for a few months. And, and as I started to come out of that season and I was talking to my wife more about it, there was just one day I just went to the little local t-shirt shop and I just made a couple shirts. And as I started wearing them out, people would start asking me about it. What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And even I had to think more about what it meant. And, you know, then God just really kind of gave me the vision for, for what it was. It's more than just a t-shirt brand or a, or a hat or a sweatshirt. It's, it's really, you know, my wife and I, and the people that we surround ourselves now in our church, like we're really trying to change culture, especially in San Diego. Um, and, and so the vision for Servant Heart is to create a culture of people that strive to serve one another. And that starts in the home. Uh, because we see so many challenges I think that we really have come from the fact that we have so many broken homes. You know, we have so many fatherless men out there. And, and so why do we have so much of the dysfunction? Because the family life isn't strong and solid. And, and so that's why I'm proud of, of my relationship with my wife, because we do try and set a, a good example for that. And if we can set an example for other people um, and, and really start to have an impact. But one of the coolest things is, is when I wear this, this stuff out, um, you know, I'll be in the airport, prime example. Every time I travel never fails. Now, I'm 45 years old. I've had, a, you know, lots of different clothes and, you know, even, even the name brand stuff with the logos on it. I've never been asked about a logo or a shirt or complimented on something as much as I have as when I wear this stuff out. And what's really cool about it is, uh, you know, I think a big challenge people have with God and religion is, is a lot of people that aren't familiar with it are scared to be like Bible thumped and people are going to force their beliefs down their throat. 
Um, and, and I was very much the same way before um, I dedicated my life to, to Jesus. And what's, what's so powerful is when somebody else asks you about it and initiates the conversation. It makes it much easier for me to tell you about my values or my message or something I have to say that's positive then if I just come up to you and just say, hey, Corey, let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about this, right? But if you ask me, hey, what does that mean? You know, and I remember when I was first getting these done, the, the little stoner kid that was, he pressing the shirts for me. He was like, he was like, dude, that's, that's kind of cool, man. He's like, is that like a, a God thing? And, you know, for me, the answer is I have my faith. But really the message is just, again, to create a culture of people that are, are serving each other, right? Um, I, th I showed the, the example. I fly a lot. I see a little old lady that's struggling to put her bag up in the overhead, you know, rows up. And there's three guys sitting there and, and everybody's so consumed in their phones or even if they're looking at her, they just watch and it's like, bro, get up and help that lady. Yeah. Go help that lady. And it starts with the smallest of things. Hold a door for somebody. Say please and thank you. Just get, you know, just get back to doing good for other people. And so, you know, the hats, the t-shirts, that's all, it's all the merchandise, but really it's a, a bigger picture, a, a shift in the culture that we're trying to create. A bunch of, a bunch of servants. Yeah. So I'll tell you, I, 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 I want to take what you said um, one step further. So first of all, it's already hard enough to, you know, for selfish people. And, and I was, a selfish person for and good. I, I can't even claim it. I'm not selfish now, mm -hmm. but I'm less selfish than I we used to. We all are, for sure, to an extent, you know. And so, one of the things when I first got sober, my sponsor said to me, "He said I want you to do one nice thing each day for somebody." And he said, "Oh wait, don't get out. Don't think you're getting off there." And I'm like, well, "What do you?" I'm like, "I, I mean, that's going to be hard enough in itself." He was like, and now, and also, I don't want you to tell anybody. And I went, oh, well, I mean, it shouldn't be that big a deal. You know how fucking hard that was for me to do? And to, to this day, it's still hard for me to do. And sometimes I wonder, there are some times when you need to tell the story because people can benefit from it. Absolutely. Sometimes you don't have to say anything. You can just yep. keep your mouth shut. And just know you did something good, but it's hard. It's hard. I remember. I remember a good friend of mine asked me one of the most powerful questions. Um, this was when I was living back on the East Coast. We had just been married a, a few months, and and I had an opportunity with the company that I've been speaking for for a number of years um, to you know start speaking on bigger stages and at, at the bigger events that they put on. And when I was kind of going through this, it, it was basically like an interview process for it. I remember my, my good friend, Jeff, asked me, he, he said, what do you do when nobody's looking? Ooh. And that's a powerful question. Mm -hmm. Who are you when nobody's looking? What are you doing for other people when nobody's looking? When nobody's going to give you the accolade, nobody's going to give you the attaboy, nobody's going to give you the pat on the back. What do you do, not just for other people, but how you, how you carry yourself in life? And you know, one of my mentors said one time, how you do anything is how you do everything. You know, so he's a multimillionaire that if he sees a penny on the ground, he's going to stop and pick up the penny because he values money. You know, and it's just like, like Andy says, and I actually, I have the quote on my vision board. It says, I don't know any multimillionaire that leaves piss droplets on the seat. I swear to God, if Lord God is my witness, that is exactly what I knew you were going to say. Not verbatim, but the, the piss on the seat. It seared into my brain, son, when he said that. And I not it's forgot something it. so simple. Mm -hmm. But how many people actually, you know, how many, how many of you, if you're in somebody else's bathroom, will you pick up somebody else's paper towel that's on the floor? I, I don't how many of you know. will pick it up for, for that business owner? So uh, you know, really I just I try and treat everything like an owner. I try and treat everything like it's mine. I, the, the old corny phrase, treat people how you want to be treated. You know, I, I treat people like I want, I treat elderly women like I want people to treat my mother if she was out. Um, I treat women like I would want them to treat my wife when we're out. You know, 
dude, you know how funny it is when people see me open the car door for my wife to get in? Yes, I do. People lose their mind. Women are elbowing their husbands like, like you need to get to work. And I think Sean Whalen posted one time, it was hilarious on, on Facebook. He said, ladies, if you have a man that doesn't open your car door for you, you have a girlfriend. And I was like, wow, Ooh, that's good. Man, like, that's good. that so, is good. You know, and, and that's obviously, that's a public gesture that, that people see, you know, but what people don't see and the only one that knows what I do for behind closed doors is my wife. You know, she's been, she had a, a business trip to Nashville. She came back just wrecked. Um, you know, with the flu, came down with something nasty. And like, all I've been trying to do is make sure she doesn't have anything to worry about all week. I got the little guy, you rest and relax, you know, do you need anything? Can I help you? And, and you just worry about you and get better. So it does, it's, and it's just, how can you serve other people? How can you make other people's lives better? So let me ask you a question. If the shoe, uh, so step back from the conversation for a second. And if the shoe was on the other foot, how would you take it if she said, if you were sick, you had some things you needed to get done. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, I, you know, I, whatever it was, she could handle it, whatever it was. Um, and she said, you just, you know, just take, take care of yourself. Just sit back and just relax. Would you have a hard time doing that? I, I think that's just part of nature of being a man. I, I would have to agree. You know? At least I'm going to agree with you because that would have been my, my answer would have been, it's really hard for me sometimes. Yeah. I mean, she, she last year had to take care of me. I was, um, I, I've never had the chills and, and been as, as sick as I was. And, um, you know, she had to take care of me, but it's definitely not easy. You know, it's like, I don't want, I don't need her worrying about taking out the trash and doing the things that are, that are my responsibilities, but you know, it's, um, it's tough. It is tough. It is tough for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it really is. Especially when you feel like, well, you know, uh, she could be doing something different or, 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 or whatever the case may be. Uh, yeah, I, I've always struggled with it and I try to get better because my wife is very nurturing and, yeah. and, and she's, um, it's ironic that we got on this conversation because I just spent an hour and a half on the phone, not the two hour conversation I told you about, <laughs> but another hour and a half conversation I didn't anticipate on. But those conversations are conversations that they're, I feel the most um, fulfilled when I get off that conversation with somebody, especially this gentleman, who's, he is significantly older than me, 60 some years old. Mm -hmm. Guy's got 15 kids. He doesn't have kids, he has a tribe. <laughs> that's, a straight that's up like crazy. tribe, right. Wow. And all oh, and all by the same woman. Wow. Which That's is awesome. also like, I mean, you don't hear about that very often anyway. Sure. So him and I are talking and the reason he called me is because we, I spoke for the first time uh, a few weeks back in Atlanta mm -hmm. and, and, and he, he was there because we were asked by one of our fellow Arte brothers to be there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really didn't know how it was going to go. I, you know, quite frankly, I, I didn't have a ton of faith in it, but I, I had faith in, I had a faith in enough that I have said I'd, I would show up. I'm going to do my part. Yep. If everybody else does their part, great. Anyway, so he had mentioned he's trying to write a book, but he's struggling because he doesn't know really what parts of his life he needs to include in the book and what parts he doesn't. And I said, well, ironically, you know, I, I had formed a course that, uh, taught personal trainers how to sell personal training because I don't know if you know anything about personal training, but most trainers either know how to sell and don't know how to train or they <laughs> do know how to train like hell, but they don't know how to sell. And most of the time it's the ones that they, they, they know how to train. Like they're really good trainers. They just suck at sales. Yep. And so I, uh, I fortunately have both. I mean, I, I don't train anymore, but I, I've always had sales, so that came easy. 
the training came fairly easy. Um, and I can't say that happened, you know, not everything comes easy for me. So don't let go and don't let me fool you. <laughs> um, and so I had created this course, but then my mind walked me right out of that course and said, you know, nobody going to buy that motherfucker. Mm-hmm. And so I said, well, wait a minute, I could turn this into a book. Why the hell not do that? Then I can ship it off to somebody. They can put the shit in order, you know, which by the way, don't do that on Fiverr because you'll get burned. <laughs> Uh, which I did great on five or some are. Yeah, that's one you don't do. Not not once, but not but twice. Anyway, yep. so uh, but by me sharing that experience with him and talking about how it, that's how kind of I had to put my puzzle pieces together, he wanted to pick my brain. This guy started seven businesses, like I told you, fifteen kids, one woman. Uh, you know, he's been through some shit. Yeah, immigrant, immigrant. You know. He's been through some shit. And so, but, but here he's asking this guy, 41 years old, you know, about how to write a book just because I have a little bit more knowledge. I don't even have a lot of knowledge. I've got a little bit more knowledge, but it makes me feel good that I was able to hopefully help him. I don't know if I helped him or not, but I don't know if he helped me or I helped him. Well, um, I, I, I bet you did. And, you know, not to stop you real quick, but you know no, the big please. challenge that, that we have? We always assume that everybody knows everything that we know. Mm. Yeah. We always assume that this person knows everything I know, and, and they're going to catch, like, especially if, let's uh, take that, that for instance. You know, and the, the reality is, well, I, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll use my own example. I coach real estate investing for a living. Oh, I didn't, okay, I did not so, know that. I've been doing real estate in, investing, you know, 10 plus years and I've been coaching for a company since 2011 on my coaching team, on the team of speakers that I have, I will undoubtedly say I'm the least qualified out of all of them. Now I know my stuff, but I got guys that are just crushing it and killing it. And their wealth of knowledge is way beyond mine. And if I let the doubt and insecurity, if I let my own little voice in my head, tell me everything that I think, which is everybody else is better than you. These people are going to know this then I wouldn't bring the value that I uniquely bring to my students. So where, yes, I have other coaches that may be more knowledgeable, have done more deals, made more money, yada, yada, yada. I will say with the utmost confidence that I create the greatest personal connection with people. Because Mm. see, for me, real estate is, is you take the 80-20 rule, it's 80% up here, 20%. Building a house is building a house, man. It's, It's some wooden sticks and cement and, electrical wiring and plumbing, right? It's not rocket science, but the things that get in the way of that business to get you there is where the challenge is. And, and the assumption I made in the very beginning, the very first time I ever went to go speak, um, I had to ask the, one of the owners of the company who's hired me to now do this in 2011, when I had only been a part of their coaching program for less than two years, and maybe, maybe done not even a dozen deals at the time. I was like, I was like, you know, what am I supposed to say? He said, here's what you need to understand. You're here for a reason. And so are they. So what you need to be able to do is even though you're speaking and coaching, we're giving you the topics to talk about. You also need to listen, figure out why they're there and then help them through that, that process. And you're not going to know the answers to all the questions. So one of my very first group of students at my very first event to do public speaking for the first time, um, which I was terrified of, um, the, the, the four people that sat in my front row were a father, his wife, and two kids, and they owned a construction business that did over $20 million a year. Ooh. You know what I was saying in my head? Oh, shit. What am I going to teach him? What am I going to teach this dude? But you know what they also did? All of them worked 60, 80 plus hours a week. Like they were killing themselves. They had a very profitable business, but they had no systems to the business. And that's one of the things that our, our company is very good at is coaching people on the systems. So where I couldn't meet him where he was at with, with that, that financial level of success I, op- I just shared with them a few things that we were doing in our little rinky dink business that totally changed their business altogether. 
and and the other beautiful part is 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 I've kept you know friends from what I've done for life because it wasn't all about just let me feed you some information and here take that and do something but we actually connected because I cared about them what they're doing and you know and their success so you know it's all up here man it really is yeah I, you I, you I, uniquely have something to offer anybody you talk to i promise you that i would have to agree with that and you know i can't always say that i would i i i, I would not say that i've always been able to say that but i have since starting this podcast i've talked to you know I, I don't really turn people down if they ever, if I get people that actually ask, which, you know, it does happen. Yep. Um, but I found that through this podcast, and I mean, you go back and listen to Sean Whalen's podcast. He was one of my first ones. Right. And we got on the mic and it was like, all right, dude, what's your story? And you know, that motherfucker was like, fuck you mean how, how much time you got like 10 days he was yeah. like well i mean what what part of the story Corey? like what what, what do you want to know and i'm like uh you know and i'm talking to sean whalen which at the time i felt like he was you know so far up above me yeah. um and but but the reality is is you're right you know um i have been able to add value to everybody that i've spoken to in some shape form or fashion and who instilled that in me the most, and this goes back to one of our mutual friends, is Ryan Williams. Because yep. that dude, you know, there was a couple of times in our in our podcast, he went, wow, I don't think I've ever thought about it like that. And I'm like, what? In my mind, I'm like, are you got to be fucking kidding? I just, I just taught you something? You're a fucking Navy SEAL, dude. Like, but he's just so, you know, he's a hump. We talk, we've, we, we've talked about him before. He's, he is, he, he's an admirable dude. If you, to, to say the least, if you don't know who he is. Well, you know, if, if you don't know who he is, go back and listen to the podcast with Ryan. Um, I met Ryan through Arte. And the funny story about my Arte journey is, is, you know, like I, I said in the beginning of my story, um, I came into Arte right as I went into a very nasty, nasty season of all my income going away business relationship you know it was the best man at my wedding of you know brother of 20 years that that really did this to me and put me in this position um and there was a there was a point where literally paying for arte i was trying to figure out what i was going to do and really had, like having to explain it to my wife you know now with a, a little a little dude and there literally was a time I had to talk to Drew and I was like, Hey Drew, man, I just, I need a, a week to get this, this payment together. And that's what I love about Andy and Ed and what they've created in the culture of Arte is they were very accommodating for all of that. But I knew there was, there was something more in the, the proximity of people that I'm now around in Arte. And Ryan was one of the most impactful because I remember the, when, when you're going through a nasty season, dude, it's, it's funny, I, I may do public speaking, but I'm actually a huge introvert by nature, um, which is another dangerous thing when we're up here in our heads all the time and we can talk ourselves out of anything. Um, so let me stop but, you real quick. When you, yeah, say na when you say nasty season, I just want to make sure that, 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 that I understand what that means because I have a feeling our stories are getting ready to be identical. Is so, that a dark, a dark time? Yeah, well, 10, well, actually almost 20 years ago, I went through a very dark time, which is probably more along what you're talking about. Okay. And, and I'll touch on that in a minute. Sure. What happened, what happened just in the, in the past two years, um, just, I had, I'm living in San Diego, moved my wife and my life and everything to San Diego to follow my dream of speaking. And now I'm a, a new dad. I mean, my kids wasn't even a, a year old at the time when all of this went down. And I had probably eighty to hundred thousand dollars of old business debt dumped onto me to 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 now be responsible for that also involved my father. Um, and when I moved out here, I stepped away from the active side of our our real estate business and was doing other things. So I know it's kind of very very broad in in what it was, but 
I basically, all my income went away. I ended up with about $80,000 worth of debt. I'm living in San Diego, which isn't the cheapest area in the world to live in. And I'm now a new dad. So I had a lot of things to, to figure out. And, and there were times, honestly, man, just getting on those Arte calls were just a huge like benefit for me mindset wise, because that that's the one great thing about what I've done for so many years is um, I've learned a lot about mindset and in, invest and I've invested a lot in myself in personal development. Doesn't mean you don't go through your stuff, you know? Um, but I remember we've got a group, the, the SoCal Artans. Um, so it's all the Southern California crew and Ryan hosted a meetup at his warehouse before he moved to his new place hosted a, a meetup for everybody at his old place with on a Sunday, which, you know, for me, I'm, I had to balance church, but I literally, I went to an early morning service so I could go meet everybody for the first time, get way out of my comfort zone. Um, cause I'm cool with, with speaking to the, the groups I speak to, cause they're there to, to, to hear me speak, but going to meet strangers has never been my thing. And man, Ryan was so humble and just shared so much. Um, just in that, that short couple of hours there. And I'll never forget when I, when I sat down, I had a, I had a white t-shirt on version of this with a, this was gold. And, uh, and that was kind of the color schemes I was, I was looking at. And, uh, I remember walking in and we all did the introductions and he was like, I like your shirt. I was like, thanks. And then, you know, we had the whole, the whole rest of the meeting and he started sharing stuff on trademarks and just all this stuff I know nothing about. I've never started a, a clothing brand or a label before. And he's sharing so much. And, and so I just asked him, I was like, hey, man, you know, I'd love to talk with you some more about this. And we ended up grabbing lunch. And actually, this color version of it, Ryan did. When we had breakfast for the first time, he said, he, he said here's, you know, here's what I would do with it. And literally pulled the laptop out. We were talking about everything. And he was like, that's the one that you need to, to, to make in print. Um, the biggest challenge I, I had moving forward with, and this is kind of what we were talking about and I was sharing some stuff with you uh, yesterday, um, just having the ability to buy a bunch of inventory, you know, and, and move that direction. But Ryan did exactly what this brand is about. He just served and helped me without anything in return. Now, since then, I've taken some church business over there. Like we have, we have a lot of things we do in our men's ministry. And so I've had them get some shirts done over there. And as I'm, I'm building the capital to really grow this brand and be able to stock inventory, then who am I going to go to? I'm going to go to the guy that just gave, you know, without a selfish bone in his body and shared so much information with me, um, invited me to come up to, to industry Threadworks anytime. And, and I did, I've been up there, you know, probably a half a dozen times, a few times, literally I was, we went and worked out one morning and he was telling me about some of the challenges he had in his business. And I went up, you know, maybe, maybe three or four times and just helped out kind of like an intern just to see how it works. He's like, yeah, dude, come up. Here's the whole team, meet everybody, sit, talk, learn. Cause he knows that, that this is the business that, that I want to grow. And I think he, he understands the mindset that if, you know, if I plant these seeds, then I'm going to reap something in the long run. Cause who am I going to be loyal to and take my business to? But that wasn't the point. It wasn't the point of <laughs> reaping the seed. It wasn't the point of reaping what you sow. It was that this guy, I know he cares about me and he cares about my brand. So I'm going to go up there and I'm going to help him out. And meanwhile, I'm going to learn some shit while I'm there. But the primary thing is, is I'm going to be of service to him because he was kind enough to open that laptop that day and do what he did for me, which was huge for you personally, your brand. It was just huge for you all around. Am I wrong? No, I, absolutely. I, I mean, to the day, I love, you know, messing with designs and, and even though I can't draw something very well, I know things that look good and I can get inspired by things and put some things together in Photoshop. And I love, you know, the little video clip I showed you for, servant heart. I did the editing on that. So I enjoy those things. And I sat with his guy, you know, one day, but the other couple of days that I went up there, man, I was just, I was just helping out packing boxes. Yeah. Labeling yeah. Stuff. Because it was, I, I want to say it was a couple of days before Black Friday. 
So they just had a, a ton of stuff coming in. And, you know, I don't say that to, to brag on myself. It's just that was a small thank you for him selflessly given to me. And, you know, and, and it's definitely something that, that I'm never going to forget. So anytime I hear somebody talk about needing shirts made, my first thought is, is industry thread works. 100%. And, and the same for me. And uh, I can't remember who it was or what it was, but same thing. And I said, well, Ryan, Ryan's definitely the guy. And whoever I was talking to, he was, well, you better have a big order. And I said, well, what does that look like? He said, well, he, he doesn't take, he's been turning a lot of people away that are less than a hundred pieces. I said, well, that's probably because, you know, it, and he, pro he probably costs him money to make a hundred pieces or less. So of course, I mean, it makes sense. So either way though, I, mean, I don't know if I've actually ever sent anybody to him, but I've tried and I will always but, send but people to him. Thing. So technically, yes, his business model is going to be in, in quantity. So wants to avoid doing things less than a hundred pieces, but you know, he and, and his, actually he wasn't there the first day I went up. Disney was there, his wife. She spent easily an hour and some change with me showing me different blends of shirts and, and going over everything. And, you know, he easily gave me a couple hours of, of his time. And, you know, I'm no fool, man. You know, it, it, it's funny. So I'll say this quote, but then I'm also going to say, I don't like this quote. Time is money, right? Sure. So, so when we're giving our time to somebody, but actually the, the more powerful quote that I share with my students all the time, you know, I'll, I'll put them in this little exercise and, and they'll, we'll be talking about something and I'll say, time is what? And they'll all, of course, say money. And that's the wrong answer. Time is everything, dude. I can make more money. I cannot make more time. Good I've boy, made dude. money. I've lost money. I can't get a single moment of my life back. So, you know, when I talk about my journey and, and where I'm at in, in my life, I took the first 15 months of my son's life off. I came off the road. I wasn't speaking. I was just here being a dad and being a father Dang. because I know there are certain moments that I can never, ever get back. And so when somebody does spend their time with me, that's more valuable than the money that's involved with it. But we're so conditioned to think, you know, dollars and, and, and paychecks and salaries. But, you know, that's time that somebody else can never, ever take back and never get back. So, you know, for Disney to spend that time with me and for, you know, Ryan to spend his time with me and then not just them, but their, their team as well. You know, I sat with a few of them and was just asking questions and, and pinging stuff. And man, they were sharing everything. And that's why his business is going to grow to what his vision of that business is going to grow. He's going to hit $300 million. Yeah. And he's going to have, and I'll never forget too, when he's sharing his vision, his vision is to have a black jet with two middle fingers on the bottom of the, of the wings. <laughs> you know? That's and, hilarious. And when you know you make a connection with somebody when you know their vision. Yeah. Right? When you know understand somebody else's vision, that's when, that's when you made a connection. And, you know, he and I are besties. We're not talking every day. But that dude has helped me a, a ton in just having the confidence and the vision of, of what we want to do with this. And, and like I said, this is just the merchandise, but it's the, the merchandise that's going to start the conversation that's going to change society. For sure. I love it, dude. Um, so did he show you, you know, you'd think this damn podcast was about Ryan, which I know, even, right? if, even, if, even if it was, it would be a good podcast because he's such a great dude. Did he show you his uh, kettlebell? I know he did. Yeah, yeah. We talked about the, the kettlebell stories. I mean, dude, it's – it's funny, man. It's some right. things with other stuff that he has in, in the office. Yeah. yeah it's it's pretty super, cool. And, and just hearing the story behind that. You know? I know. Yeah. And, and it's funny, you know, you say this kind of, kind of a, a Ryan conversation. I think this is just really the impact that, that Arate has on people. And that's sure. what's so cool about what Andy and Ed have built and the vision that they have for it is it's more than just some little mentorship program, man. It's the bonds and the connections that are happening outside of it that are, that are helping to, to make that change in society, you know, the same way a lot of us want to make. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I've told several people this, and I may have even told you this uh, yesterday or whenever. Um, you know, since, since I went to that meeting in, in October, which was my first RTA meeting, 
Yeah. Um, and it was the first, I wasn't an accelerator member at the time. Um, but that weekend and Ryan is the reason this podcast started and, yep. and it's, I have never in my life done anything. I've sold shit that have made a lot of money that I feel like it was the best thing on the earth. But I'm going to tell you right now, nothing has fulfilled my soul like doing this podcast. Yep. And you know what? Selfishly, I fill myself up by having these conversations with people like you or whoever yeah. it is, you know, and I don't care if you got a thousand followers or 500,000, it doesn't make a fuck to me. I'm going to have a co same conversation with you as I do them. Yep. Um, so, um, how, uh, so, so you said you, you coach and speak to, just pr primarily real estate people. Uh, is it, is it, is it, is it investors? Is it builders? Is it both? Is it, tell me what kind of, uh, like if it were good, if, if there was going to be a name of a, uh, the name on the billboard, what would it be? Yeah. So I coach for a company It's one of the largest real estate education companies in the country targeted towards real estate investors. So when you see the late night infomercial of, Hey, we can teach you how to invest in real estate, learn how to flip houses, learn how to build wealth. Um, that's one of the programs that I coach for. Um, it's Sounds easy like Dean. What's that? Sounds like Dean Graciosi. It's not Graciosi. It's a company called the Fortune Builders. Okay. And so it's easy for me to do because I started off as a student. Um, I started off as a, a student with my business partner at the time back in June 2009. And that's when I, I learned even more the value of coaching and, and mentorship. Um, when I joined, I was over $100,000 in, in debt. Uh, so so to, to back up to that other part of the story where we probably connect a little bit more. Back in 2001, um, I, well, I graduated college in 1998 with a business degree. I went straight into IT. Um, I moved up the corporate ladder pretty quick, got into Department of Defense contracting, carried a secret security clearance. People would always ask me, well, what'd you used to do for a living? Well, if I, you know, I was making a joke. Well, if I told you I'd have to kill you, so I just tell people that I saved the world. And um, so I, I did the were, department. Were you in DC by chance? I was. Do, I you, was. Know, do you know a guy named uh, Steve Burke? No. Mm. It's weird because the, the name actually does sound familiar. I'm more of a face guy than, than a name guy, but right. that name does ring a bell. If you show me a picture of him, I'll tell you if I know him. Okay. Um, but was very much in, in the IT world. So, you know, mid to late 20s, early 2000s, man, I was on top of the world. I'm making IT money. Life was, life was great. <clears throat> me and some friends, we decided we were going to get into um, some music stuff because so, I had some, some friends that were really, really talented and, um, you know, I, I'm always sort of a big picture, big picture kind of guy, visionary kind of guy. And um, so we started doing our little thing and making a little buzz for ourselves. And uh, but we didn't have like, hey, let's start a record label kind of money. And but by going out to the clubs and connecting with people, we met a guy who had a lot of money, but not a lot of talent. We had a lot of talent, not a lot of money. So we partnered up with this guy. And I remember one time I hung out with him for a week straight. Every day after work, I went and hung out with him. and you know, he's got a big, big dude, hat turned backwards, sweatpants, the freshest Jordans, an Escalade on 26 inch rims. And literally four days out of that week, we went to the bank and he cashed anywhere from a $20,000 to an $80,000 check. Damn. So I'm sitting there looking at this dude, like if you're going to stereotype somebody, he looks like your neighborhood pharmaceutical distributor. If you catch my drift, right? I, I do. And, and, and I'm this, I'm this little dude with a secret security clearance investigated by the department of defense, et cetera. And I'm like, ah, uh, so I asked him one day, I was like, bro, what do you do for a living? Cause if it's what I think you do, I'm the wrong kid to be in the truck with you right now. And he was like, no, nothing like that. He said, I flip houses, I own rental properties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, wow. So he started telling me about the rental properties and how he's, you know, getting checks from section eight coming in every month. And I was like, dude, can you show me how to do that? He said, yeah. So I go home and 
I talked to, and, and at, the, at during this time, so I'm a mama and a daddy's boy, and I'm not ashamed of it. My parents are a little bit older. My mom's 81 now. My dad's 91. And, uh, and so I lived at home at the time. So I'm Eight, making what? 80, 81 and 91. My, my mom is now 81 years old and my dad's 91 years old. Oh, both of them, wow. both of them still live at home. Um, but at that time I was living at home and, you know, kind of like a, an in-law suite on the back of the house, not paying rent. My rent was helping out around the house and things like that. And so I'm making it money living at home. And so my dad's my best friend in the world. Like I love my parents to, to death. And, and so I go home and I tell him about, you know, the wanting to get into real estate and getting some rental properties. And, and at this time he's now retired from the FBI and, uh, you know, so he was like, well, I wouldn't mind having some, some extra money coming in. So he decided we were going to do it together. And in the span of like two months, we bought five houses. And I use the term houses loosely. Like we bought five dumps. Like if you've ever seen the horror movie Saw, you could have filmed the entire series in these houses. <laughs> like, I can't, I'm, I'm surprised we never found a dead body in these things, to be honest. So he, the way my, my buddy tells me that the process is going to work and he's going to mentor us, us through it is he's going to flip us the houses, pull the money out, get all the work done to them, and then show us how to put the tenants in them. And now we'll start, you know, our real estate empire. All right. So when you say he, uh, sorry, sorry, say that process again. I, I don't so know if he I call it. He said that he's, he, owns, he owns these houses already. He's going to sell them to us. Okay. Basically flip them to us. In that flip, he's going to pull the money out, the profit that he makes, to then do the repairs. So we're thinking, we don't know any better. We think that all sounds good. If you're investing in real estate and you're buying rental properties, you want them to be what's called turnkey, meaning you buy it ready to place a tenant in it. Because what happened was these five dumps, he sells to us at retail price. Because this is 2001 when you could hire your own appraisers. It was like the wild, wild west of real estate. So he sells us the houses at retail price, pulls the money out to start doing the repairs, and, and they got done for like the first couple of weeks, but then all of a sudden the guys aren't fixing the houses, they're not there, he's not answering the phone as much, he's got all the money to do the repairs, but I've got five mortgages that we now So have. wait a minute, wait a minute, I still, okay, so let's just hypothetically say this one dump, cost he sold it to you for a hundred thousand dollars right right and the dump is still a dump only uh, worth fifty thousand dollars okay all right so i just want to make sure my my brain was connecting that okay yeah no right, you're, so you're connecting it right uh, we okay. did it completely wrong okay so, so it's it's as is value is as it sat as a dump was let's say fifty thousand dollars it needed you know Thirty or forty thousand dollars in repairs, easy. at least. Yeah. He sold it to us for a hundred to take his fifty that he bought it for, then pull out the money, do the repairs, and still make a couple bucks on the deal. Okay. So we now own this dump, but we paid the full hundred for it. He's got the repair money. Right. So what ended up happening was, and we did five at basically one time. So we got five of them, and so what ends up happening. <laughs> He's not answering his phone. So one day I drove to his house and I knocked on the door and he answered the door. And man, he, I mean, he just looked like a defeated man. Looked like somebody had kicked his puppy. And he was a big boy too. He's like six, three and just he's like, man, come inside. We got to talk. And I'm like, all right. So we go down, you know, in his living room, big fancy couch. And, and he said, man, we got a problem. I said, I'm kind of figuring that out. And he said, yeah. <laughs> he said, my wife found out I was cheating on. Her. And I was like, man, that sucks. What's that got to do with my house? <laughs> All the bank accounts were in her name. Yeah, there you go. You got it. It sank in real quick. <laughs> Some people, it takes a minute. Women get it right away. Guys are like, huh? Oh. So she freezes all the bank accounts, cuts them out of everything. And now she has all my money to fix the houses. His fucking so, girlfriend, not even wife. No, no, no. It was his wife. Oh, it was his wife. Yeah, okay, it was sorry. his wife. Yeah. All right. All right. So she cuts him out of everything. She has all the money to do all the rehabs. And now we own five property, five dumps. So the hundred thousand dollars I about had saved in the bank over the next two years, I end up a hundred thousand dollars in debt. 
But the harder part for me was not the money I lost because I was still young, dude. I'll make it, you know, make it back. No problem. My dad who worked all of his life, I'm the last of six kids. I didn't have student loans. I didn't have student debt. Um, but any of us that wanted to go through school, through school, greatest dad in the world, um, he lost all his retirement. Oh. So in that span of less than two years, and, 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 and the guilt I always carried is I felt like I bankrupted my family. I bankrupted my parents. And so this is where our story probably starts to share some similarities. Um, it was a really tough time for me. Uh, I'm now, I'm having to learn how, I'm having to learn how to rehab houses. I'm having to learn real estate. Um, I'm working IT. The good part was, is I was a contractor paid hourly. So I could just work more hours and make more money. So when it was the end of the month and I had five mortgages to pay, I was, I worked anywhere from 16 to 32 hour shifts just, yeah, to, just to be able to, to make the payments. So my dad's credit wouldn't get all banged up. Um, so over the next six, almost eight years, I'm trying to clean this mess up, sell whatever I can sell, pay the loss, um, fix a few of them up into a point where I don't feel like a complete slumlord, put some tenants in them. Uh, the first two tenants that I got were what we refer to in the industry now as professional tenants. Basically, they know the laws better than the people that wrote the laws. So they know how to move in, take a, advantage of the whole entire system, never pay a dime of rent until you evict them, and then they're going to move on. And they just go from house to house to house to, and doing this to people. So the first two tenants I had never paid a dime. And it took me eight months to get them out of one property and nine months to get them out of a, another property. And I had to pay the mortgages while they were freeloading, squatting in my houses. And that's and, because of the law in the state? The laws in, in, in Maryland and D.C. are very tenant friendly. Yes, so this goes back to, to why I, I think it's valuable to invest in your education and you know, some people complain about the prices of programs and this, that, and the third, but real estate is not a cheap business, you know, to make mistakes in and, and learn the hard way. So, whereas you may spend some money in a good coaching program, an ethical coaching program, our program has been around over 10 plus years, and that's why I can still go do what I do. But, you know, I didn't know about all of this stuff. And, and so, I remember I was sitting in our IT office one day, and it's 2008 or so to early 2009. Um, you know, I'm a hundred thousand dollars in, in debt. Um, I had, and actually I'll, I'll back up a little bit during that, during that six, almost eight years. Um, I, I got very super introverted. I was working all the time. Um, I got so depressed. I was in a really, really dark, dark place. And, but I was too embarrassed to talk to friends and, and talk to, to family about it. And um, so I went and I like, I literally one day just Googled like psychiatrist. Like I just needed help. I needed somebody to talk to. I, I, I needed to talk to a professional. And, um, and I remember I booked off, like I blocked off like four hours of my afternoon. Cause I'm thinking I'm going to go be on a couch telling all my life's problems. And I go in this guy's office, man, and I'm in there maybe five minutes. Of, he asked me what's wrong, and I'm telling him, and he, he stops me. He said, oh, I know what's wrong with you. You're depressed. And I'm like, hmm, kind of knew that coming in here. And, uh, and he said, here you go. And he writes me a prescription for Wellbutrin, you know, an antidepressant. Oh, yeah. So no. I was like, okay, he's, he's a professional. He must know what he's doing, and, and I'm screwed up. So... I leave. I tell you, he says, you know, check back with me in a month. So I go home, start taking the stuff. And uh, so now I'm, I'm starting to feel a little bit better. My lows aren't as low, but now I can't focus on anything. So when I go back, I'm like, yeah, doc, I, you know, I'm not a sad, but dude, I'm like, I'm all over the place. I can't, can't keep a straight thought. And he said, oh, that's because you have ADD. And I'm like, man, I do. Whoa. Didn't even know that. So he pulls out his little pad and he writes me a prescription for Adderall. And for most people that don't know what Adderall is, it's an amphetamine. So for what some people jabbing a needle in their, in their arm on a street corner, this guy's got a legal pad to write it for us and will get paid off of that. So now, um, you know, I'm not feeling quite as sad. I'm getting a lot of things done really, really fast. Yeah. 
but I'm also staying up 16, 18, 24 plus hours because I'm basically on speed, a yeah. prescribed speed. Hell yeah. So, but what also comes with that, like imagine drinking literally, I don't know, take, take this right here, fill it with sh double shots of espresso and drink the whole thing. I you take know, Adderall, so, so I, I, I feel you. So, so next thing you know, I'm starting to have anxiety attacks, right? So when I go back, you know, a month later, I'm like, yeah, doc, I'm getting a lot of things done better now. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, but I'm freaking out. Freaking he said, out. Oh, it's because you have an anxiety disorder. I'm like, bro, I am, I am all whacked out. Here you go, take this Xanax. And so, God. you know, then obviously I, I, obviously I couldn't sleep. So it'd be 5.30 in the morning. I'm like, hootie the owl. I got to be at work the next morning. And I'm like, doc, I can't sleep. He said, oh, it's because you have a sleeping disorder. And he prescribed Ambien. me Ambien. So there I was, Wellbutrin, Adderall, Xanax, and Ambien for almost like over two years. And I literally, man, I became a zombie. I was working remote from home, wasn't coming out, was down to about 160 pounds because I wasn't eating anything, barely saw daylight. Like one day I looked in the mirror, dude, and I didn't even, I like, I was soulless. I didn't even know who I was. And uh, I remember hating who I saw in the mirror and I took everything. And by the way, this is not doctor's advice. This was a terrible approach but I took it all and I flushed it down the toilet and I never went back to that dude. And I spent the next 30, almost 60 days just detoxing. And it was, it was absolutely miserable, but I started looking, this is when I started getting into personal development real heavy. And uh, I remember finding, finding Simon Sinek and I found a video where he talks mm. about his wife and, uh, and that just really resonated with me, you know, because like selfishly, we'll do a lot of things for ourselves, but I think we'll do even less for ourselves than we'll do for other people. And so what I started to do is become very in touch with what my why was. And, and, and I think there, there's two things that I have in my life is, is I have my vision, which is mine. And then I have my why and, and why's tend to be very externally focused. Right. So at that time, my why was my parents. Like, it was my responsibility to, 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 I did this, I need to fix this. My dad's retired. Um, and so I just started leaning more and more into personal development. And, and fast forward to, to 2008, early 2009, I'm in the office with, uh, with my best friend at the time. And, and he turns to me and he says, hey, we're going to buy a house and we're going to rehab it. Like, what do you think my first reaction was? Uh, no. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> and I was like, nope, no way, not going to do it. Mm -mm. No, sir. -y. But one thing about the, the dude, no matter what we've, we've been through to this point, he's the type of dude when he puts his mind to something like failure is not an option. So I trusted him. And, and really at this point now, you know, I'm, I'm borrowing his confidence just to, just to survive. And uh, so we buy him. So hang on that, that, that sentence right there. Some God, nobody has ever, 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 ever said that to me. That is pretty powerful because sometimes you got to do that. That's that. That's good shit right there. Um, when when we're done with this call, I'll share a link. Um, I was I was honored enough last year, and I was asked by our church to to preach my first message at church, which was okay. a huge, which was a huge deal for me. And actually the title of the message is Borrowed Confidence. So it, it talks about this, this story and it talks about this piece. Um, and it's, it's not too long if anybody else you know, wants to see it. It's about a 10, 15 minute message. Um, but I literally had to borrow somebody else's confidence to survive. Um, and you know, he's, he's pretty, pretty confident dude to, to say the least. And so I latched onto that. And so we buy this house and everything that could go wrong went wrong. And we, instead of being in and out like eight or 10 weeks, it was eight months, we were $30,000 over budget. But what we ended up doing was um, we, we had a, a, an investment loan, an expensive loan to, to buy it and do the renovation. We refinanced it into a buy and hold loan and kept it as a rental property. And so we were able to pull out about $40,000 in that and now have a cash flowing rental property. So what I realized was real estate wasn't the problem. It was who I got involved with real estate the first time around was the problem. 
Um, and that's when we found the, the coaching program because, you know, we had made a lot of mistakes, but we had still made money. Like, man, what if we actually knew what we were doing? You know, this hmm. could be really good. And so we found, we found fortune builder program. And at the time, you know, they, they lured us in with a, you know, an attend a free event kind of, kind of thing. But back then they weren't traveling the country like they are now. So we had to choose between Jacksonville or LA. We decided we'll take a business trip out to LA and, um, you know, learn everything we can at this little three day free event that they're doing. We knew about their highest level coaching program called mastery. We knew about the price tag involved. But every credit card I had was maxed out. Like I didn't have the money to do it. Um, so we fly out there and we made like a blood brother pack. Like we are not joining this program or we are out there. Nope, mm -mm, no, sir. And uh, we got out there and the people we were around, similar to like an RTA man, the people we were around, we knew we were in the right place with the right people and it was the right thing to do. I just didn't know the how. And it, it's so funny that, you know, we were talking about 75 hard and, and we were sharing our stories. I'm, I'm restarting it. Uh, I've completed it once, but I'm going back and doing it uh, again because um, I got so much value out of it. So I went back and listened to the Iron Cowboy episode of Andy's podcast. And he said, he said, and there's something that, that now rings true to me so bad. He says, and I'm going to butcher it, but essentially when you know your why or your why is big enough, you will always figure out the how. True. So when, when your why is so big and so powerful, so now my why is my wife and kid. Like, I'll die for them. You know what I mean? So when you're attached, when you're really attached to what your why is, you'll figure out the how. So we're out in L.A. I, 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 I want to do it. Man, we can do so well in this. We could crush this. You know, my business, my best friend didn't have a, a ton of money at the time either. And so I just called my other best friend in the world. I called my pops and I was like, Hey dad, I was like, you know, um, I'm out here in LA. He was like, what are you doing in LA? I said, Oh, well, I'm out at this real estate thing. And <laughs> so he starts busting out laughing. Like, what the hell are you doing out there? I said, well, you know, we came out to, to learn some stuff and, you know, and I just started telling them about the program and I was like, you know, I just don't know how, how to do it. And there was, I just, I'll never forget, there was this big, long pause on the other end of the phone. And uh, then he said, well, he said, that's the last amount I have on my last credit card. Don't screw it up. And so there, we were, there was your why. There, and there was the how. There so was the my, how, I, yeah. My, my why gave me the how. Um, and so now at this point, you know, it's failure is definitely not an option. Mm -mm. So, you know, we, we joined the program and all we did was we never missed a single call with our coaches. We listened to everything that they told us to do. We didn't try and build a better mousetrap. We didn't question why they did things the way that they did. We said, tell us what to do. We're going to go do it. And then we execute. And so over the next almost two years, we kind of became their, their, you know, Maryland and DC success stories. And, you know, I got a call from the owners, one of the owners one day, and he said, Hey, we're starting to do this, this, this new piece for our coaching students. Um, it's going to add a lot of value to them. We're going to fly coaches in, you know, they've, they've just invested a lot of money into this program. We're going to uh, fly a coach in to spend a weekend with them in their city and get them set up would you and would you like to be one of those coaches and so i was the second coach um on the team to to do that back in 2011 and it was the most transformational thing that i've ever done because just like you know you the the learning lesson here is man we're never going to be ready for what we're going to do you know you weren't ready for the podcast but look at you now you know i definitely wasn't ready to do quote unquote public speaking because What's in people's number one fear in life above death, public speaking, you know, yeah. it was fine. like I failed every book report I ever had to give in class. Cause I always skipped school. Cause I was petrified to do it. But what I found out is if you're passionate about the, the subject, you understand the subject pretty well, it's easy to go have a conversation with people. And so that's how I lead my events, man. I lead from the heart. I try and really listen to people and meet them where they're at. 
and just, you know, the, the biggest challenge that they have is they're just freaked out. They just invested a, a lot of money. It, for most of them, it's a brand new thing that they're going to do, but they don't want to be in that rat race anymore. And so I can relate to it because I was $100,000 in debt when we joined the program. I was working a full-time I teach actually more than full time with the hours I was doing and we were building a real estate business at the same time. So it was easy for me to, to kind of build confidence in them just because I was a, I was a product of it. So it's, um, and it, that was it's, a been, it's been one of the most life, life changing things that I've, I've ever done because what I realized, man, is I'm just, I'm passionate about seeing other people win. Like, yeah. You know, that's, that's why, that's why Andy resonates so well with me because I do, man, I love it when people around me win and I don't care if I'm losing, right? Sure. I'm going through. So, so the first time I lost all the money with my dad, I used to say that was the worst thing that ever happened to me because it led to the addiction, you know, it led to so many struggles, you know, such a, a dark, dark time and place and, and challenges for my parents. But the reality is, man, what just happened in, in the end of 2018 was actually worse than then because this time it was my, it was my brother that did it to me this time. It was, oh, you know, that's the business partner? That was my business. He was my, he's not, he's not legally my brother, but oh, he whatever. Was, yeah. He was, he was like my brother of 20 years. He was my best friend in the world. He was the dude that I was borrowing my confidence from all those years and he was the one that cut me out of the business because we had we had some difference of values and opinions on how things were going in and should go and you know so he just said well bam I'll, I'll cut him off and now I'm out in San Diego again I'd come off the road I'm not speaking I'm spending time with my family but that was my main source of, of income and, and what I was doing and so the reason why that's the worst time of my life for me is because the first thing that happened was a stranger. This was somebody that I, I would trust with my life, my wife with anything. And that's what, what made it harder. But what was so much better this time around is, and this is what I share in that message is before I was born confidence from another man. But now that, you know, I've dedicated my life to, to Jesus and now I've leaned into the word and the Bible. I don't borrow my confidence. I don't borrow my confidence from another man anymore. I borrow my confidence from a different direction. So I've just, man, I've leaned in heavy to my faith. I've leaned heavy into prayer. And, and that's literally what's, what's kept me out of those dark places and my church family. Yeah, dude. That's powerful, dude. I was not anticipating all that. Yeah, we, we didn't go there yet. We hadn't no, gone there. that was great, man. No, I so that, that and, I, and I would say, you know, I will, we, need, we got to wrap up and I was going to say, well, what would you leave everybody with? Well, I guess you just left it. Yeah. I mean, here's, that here's, shit was. Here's, here's what I would love to, to leave people with. Um, what I go do on, on the weekends when I speak, I'm serving other people, right? Um, and now, you know, I'm, I'm very transparent about it. When I go on the road now, um, I, even, I even share this with my students so they really understand the, the level that, that I want to see them succeed and how well I want them to do and how much I, I genuinely care. Because listen, there's a lot of these companies where people, all they care about is selling you into a coaching and a mentoring program and then take your money and, and see you later. The reason why I've been able to do what I do for so many years is because the culture is different. It's an RTA type culture. It's a different company altogether, but it's an RTA type culture that genuinely cares a, about the, the people and the success. Um, but it's now a sacrifice for me to leave on the weekends. Yeah, bad. Right? My yeah. wife, she's a, you know, She's a, a sales exec for Dell. You know, fortunately, during the week, we both work, you know, here at home. But her work week is, is during the week. Well, my, my work is on the weekends. So every weekend I go and travel, I'm taking away time from my family. And, and now we have a, a, a two-year-old, you know. 
Um, so there are some certain things that I miss and, and I really, I like people to understand that this sacrifice that I'm taking to, to be here this weekend is because I genuinely, I want to plant a seed like people have planted in me to change the, the trajectory of your life, right? I want to see you be better. I want to see you go out there and win. And I know, you know, we, we've got all the, the cliche quotes. I know if I help enough other people get what they want in life, I'm going to get what I want in life. Yeah. And my vision, like my vision's right, right here. I have it, you know, on a, on a poster and, and I'll read it to you. Um, it says, I want to live off of 10% of my income and give away 90 to help other people. Uh, in doing that, I want to impact over a million people's lives in a positive manner through my teaching, speaking, and motivation, um, and leave a ripple that changes the world. And I say all of that so that I can just be the most present husband and father that I can be. Because again, I, I, we want to create a culture of people to strive to outserve one another, and that starts in the home. That's right. I want to make sure my core, my wife is taken care of. My son is, is raised by me right um and so i want to go be a service to other people because that'll allow me to be an even bigger service to to those closest to me yeah so uh i want to wrap up with this i'm going to leave you with the challenge because i've got to hop on another call but my challenge to you is add uh a zero before that one yeah did i say did i say that right yeah i got because you. because that's going to be an easy number for you to hit Break yeah. it down. You impact a lot of people. Dude, you sound, a lot you of people. Just like just like my wife this morning. We were talking uh, we were talking some some vision stuff and uh you know, like financial goals and things like that. And she said, Well, how much, you know, how much would be enough for you? And I said, Well, this. she was like, Oh, mm, you're thinking too small. I was like, Whoa, whoa, okay, all right. Yeah. Challenge challenge challenge. And, and, and that's powerful that yeah. you've got somebody that 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 will do that for you. Hey man, I, I got I got to be a little alpha woman over here, man. She's a she's a boss, and you know she's she's been the one, dude, and you know she's been my rock over yeah. the past. You know, we'll be married five years in in July, and, and it's been absolutely incredible. And five years in March. There you go. See, so dang, it, it's been incredible, and she's given me the the best little dude, and so we're just yeah. we're just having fun and and see what we can do to leave a positive impact, man. Yeah. All right, my man. Well, let me wrap this thing up, dude. I got to, I got to rock and roll. Dan, thank you, man. I appreciate it, brother. And uh, I'll connect with you shortly. Yeah, dude. Thank, thank you so much for having me, man. It was my honor. My pleasure, brother. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon, my man. All right. Later.